Shabbat Shalom. Eight years ago, November 2015, Lindsay and I were living in Jerusalem, and we hosted a large Thanksgiving meal for our friends, and after dinner, we went around the room saying things we were grateful for, and we announced publicly for the first time that Lindsay was pregnant, and we were expecting our first child that summer. The next day, I was walking out near the old city, and I saw something that I just had to document and share with my wider circle of friends, family, and acquaintances. So I pulled out my cell phone, I took a picture, opened up Facebook, and I wrote the following post. I appreciate that even though I am a stranger in a strange land, many miles from home, there is public recognition of my people's tribal customs. The picture that went along with this post, a giant poster outside a fancy clothing store in Manila Mall, advertising their Black Friday sale. <laughs> even, even in Jerusalem. Now, if you've paid attention to my sermons in the past, you may recall that I always have a goal of focusing on something from the triennial reading of the Parsha, something that was actually chanted today. And if you're really paying attention, you may notice that every time I point out this fact is when focusing on the triennial reading is particularly challenging, <laughs> as it is this week. Because Vayetze is such a rich Parsha, filled with drama. We open with Jacob fleeing from his brother. We have his vision of the ladder with angels going up and down. He meets Rachel, the love of his life. He's tricked by Levan into marrying Leah first. There's this competition between Rachel and Leah to provide Jacob with children, with Rachel, the favored, but struggling with infertility, while Leah, the unloved, has many children. Each sister ends up bringing their handmaidens, Bilha and Zilpha, into this competition as well. Twelve children are born. Jacob becomes rich. He eventually decides to flee from his father-in-law, who chases him down, may have sought to do him harm, had it not been for a vision God sent to Levan in a dream to leave Jacob alone. A lot of rich material. So what do we get this year? The second year of a three-year cycle. We get two strange stories. First, we learn of Leah's oldest son, Ruvain, finding Dudaim. And I'm not going to translate that on purpose right now. He finds Dudaim in the field and brings them to his mother. Rachel, for some reason, wants them. And Leah gets angry at her sister for requesting them, saying, you've taken my husband and now you want to take my son's Dudaim. Rachel does, so she offers to let Jacob sleep with Leah that night in exchange for the Dudaim, and as a result, Leah becomes pregnant with her fifth son, Issachar, which will be followed by a sixth, Zebulun, and a daughter, Dina. And Rachel then finally has a child, Joseph. So after this story, the last of the four of the 12 children that were going to be born to Jacob and Haran have been born, we get Another strange story. We get Jacob and Levan's final conflict to get the upper hand over one another. After Joseph is born, Jacob asks Levan for permission to leave and return home. But Levan doesn't seem to hear Jacob and instead asks him what he should pay Jacob for his labor. Eventually, Jacob agrees to work for all the dark colored sheep and the spotted and speckled goats. Levan agrees, but that very day, he removes all of those sheep and goats from his flock, giving them to his sons and sending them a three days journey away from the main flock. Levan thinks that this will reduce the number of sheep and goats he will have to give Jacob in the future. But Jacob doesn't give up. He doesn't throw up his hands and say, what's the use? He doesn't say, abandon sheep. But rather, he proves to be a real goat getter. And they're bad, I know. <laughs> but he ends up enriching himself. He peels off the bark from almond and poplar rods. 
He sets those rods in front of the goats as they made it, and apparently through some kind of sympathetic magic, this leads to the goats having speckled and spotted offspring. Similarly, by having the sheep facing the dark-covered animals in Levan's flock, they too have dark-colored offspring. So in the end, Jacob becomes very wealthy, while Levan's flock decline in number and quality. God then tells Jacob it's time to go. Jacob talks to his wives, and they agree. That's what we get in the Parsha this week. The incident with the Dudaim and the flocks mating by the rods. Not the easiest section for a sermon. In fact, the opening verse, the first line of our triennial reading, and Reuven went in the days of the wheat harvest and found Dudaim in the field, is one of the verses that the rabbis in the Talmud imagine the wicked king Menashe using to challenge the validity of the Torah, asking why would Moses take the time to write down such inconsequential verses like this one, or the verse, and the sister of Lotan was Timnah. But even these verses, the rabbis maintain, were valuable and full of meaning if we just look at them the right way. So here we go. So far, I've not translated the Hebrew word dudaim for the plant that Reuven found in the field and gave to his mother, the plant that Rachel wanted, so much so that she gave up her night with Jacob to acquire them. Now, the commentators have several different understandings of what this word could mean. It could mean mandrake, which is what we see in the JPS translation. It could mean jasmine. It could mean figs. So we don't know exactly what it is, although it is something at least that is nice to look at or to smell or to eat. In addition to not knowing what the Judaim are exactly, we also don't know why Rachel wants them so badly. The most common interpretation is it is some kind of aphrodisiac or it is something that can boost fertility, although it's not actually said. Rachel desperately wants a child, so this interpretation could make sense. It does confuse Ibn Ezra, though, because he believes Dudaim are mandrakes, but he notes that mandrakes are actually a contraceptive. <laughs> so Rabbeinu Bachia notes and concludes from this that Rachel's desire for the Dudaim is actually to show her immense faith in God. She's not relying on any natural intervention to conceive children. In fact, if she gets pregnant, the Dudaim prove it was only from God. I, I happen to prefer, of all these interpretations, what Ramban has to say about this plant and why Rachel wanted it. He says it simply smelled nice. It's a nice smelling plant, and Rachel, having no children of her own, was seeking comfort in the simple pleasure of a nice smelling flower. Regardless of why she wants the plant, she was willing to give up her night with Jacob for them. So Leah slept with him that night, and as a result, had her fifth son, Issachar, despite the fact that she had previously stopped having children after giving birth to Judah, her fourth son. Now the verse that mentions Jacob sleeping with Leah, 3016, is a bit unusual. It says, Vayishkav ima belailahu. The JPS translates this, and he lay with her that night. But this translation glosses over the unusual Hebrew. If it really had wanted to say that night, it should have said, Balilahahu, not Balilahu. So a more accurate translation would be, and he slept with her in the night, he. Or he slept with her in the night, it. The Hebrew doesn't really make grammatical sense. Now, there are various mystical explanations for this unusual form, while others point out that sometimes the Torah is just written in this unusual manner, and you shouldn't make a big deal out of it. Who versus ha who, who cares? <laughs> but I think, I think the purpose is to jar us a bit, to make us pay more attention to everything around it before and after. Because immediately after, we read, Vayishma Elohim Eleah, and God listened to Leah 
and she conceived. God listens. And a few verses later, 3022, we find that God listens to Rachel, and she conceives. God listens. And it's a good thing God is listening, because no one else is in this story. No one's listening to each other. For whatever reason Rachel wanted the Dudaim, Leah doesn't hear it. She just sees her as the competition. And Rachel is the same way. Neither of them can hear the pain in the voice of the other. But God does. And it's God who provides. And the second story, too. Levan does not hear Jacob. He very intentionally ignores his request to leave, changing the subject to wages. And Jacob falls into Levan's trap and spends another six years in Haran. During this time, he involves himself in these tricks with rods to acquire more and more. It's only after hearing the voice of God that he is able to break out of this competitive cycle of material acquisition. And in his conversation with his wives, he points out that really all he has gained came from God, not anything he may have done with these rods. So in both stories, people are not hearing one another. And this lack of hearing, this lack of listening pushes them into competitions that seem to be zero-sum games. Any child Leah has is a threat to Rachel, and vice versa. Any lamb or kid that Jacob gets is one fewer for Levon. But when we move to the divine perspective, God listens to both Rachel and to Leah. And when Jacob is able to listen to God, he is able to finally break away from Levon and this materialistic culture and begin the process of ending his exile and returning home. We just celebrated Thanksgiving, a time for us to name our blessings and to express thanks. But immediately following, we have Black Friday and the call to acquire more. Levon's voice can be enticing. It can be hard to ignore. But I pray that now and always, we can turn away from that voice and instead hear the voices of those around us and realize that we are not in competition with each other, but that we can raise each other up if only we can listen. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.